Coming up on SciTech Now, a scientific taste test. So today we are actually tasting bugs and putting bugs in our food. Blurring lines between reality and the virtual world. This could be video game characters running around in here with us. It could be information about your computer, so I could look at it and I could see how to actually take the computer apart. A small bird's guide to survival, how the chickadee adapts to change. This is a smaller nest, so you can see that they typically will build a layer of moss and then they'll build a cup on top. Mapping the mysteries of the brain. It's architecture, so what, what is going on at the microscopic level, uh, how different parts of the brain are connected, and then how uh, individual areas of the brain are organized. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. For more than two billion people, insects are a part of a daily diet. They're packed with nutrients and they're eco-friendly. So why is this story already making some of you cringe? SciTech producer Bill Hallman takes a look. So today we are actually tasting bugs and putting bugs in our food. The muscles in an insect are pretty much the same kinds of muscles that you would find in a chicken wing. Chicken wing, chicken wing, chicken wing. Okay, wait. I can explain. We're at Penn State's Great Insect Fair. If it crawls, flies, or flutters, you can find it here. But this is no freak show. Our biggest problem as entomologists is exposing people. I mean, people are scared and people are tentative, especially about this stuff and putting stuff in their mouth or touching it or whatever. It's because they don't know. Well, I think a lot of children start out being interested and curious about the natural world. And I think maybe as you grow older, it seems to fade away as people tell you you should be afraid of it. If someone told these kids to be afraid, they weren't listening. What's your favorite part of the podcast? I gotta see the cockroach so far. Cockroach. My favorite kind of bug is a little tiny ant. A little tiny ant. Well, all bugs are my favorite. If this fair is a battle for hearts and minds, the entomologists are winning. And some hope their influence will extend from the classroom all the way to the dining room. After this, I'm gonna go over to the insect deli. It's true. These scientists want you to eat bugs. You're probably asking why. You can do it. Bugs as a product uh, that you add to foods are very nutritionally dense. They have high levels of protein, uh, healthy fats, as well as other uh, micro and other macronutrients. Nutrients like amino acids, calcium, iron, and zinc. When it comes to protein, an insect like a cricket is right up there with meat and milk. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Insects will be a main ingredient in the fight against global hunger and the effort to meet the demands of a growing population. The UN estimates 9 billion people will be living on planet Earth by 2050. Not only will we need more food, but we'll need more space. And insects require less land, less water, and because they're cold-blooded, less food than traditional livestock. You can get the same amount of protein from crickets as you can from cows for one twelfth of the food, leaving more resources for humans. This isn't a wild idea. About two billion people around the world eat insects regularly. So why shouldn't we? Ooh. Yeah, see? Yeah. It's refreshing. It's crisp. <laughs> Tell me it's crisp. Crispy yeah. crisps. It's good. There we go. All right. Okay. No goo, no guts, just crunch. Realistically, the scientists here know they aren't gonna change your grocery list overnight. But with a little exposure and a little education, big things are possible. Be open to learning more about them. Cause we're only really afraid of things we don't know about. Once you learn, you'll, you'll come to love them. Everyone's dabbled in their own little corner of entomology, and it's so big, it's spread. We have engineers, we have the, the pest management, we just have the people that are doing it for the beauty of it. I don't know, I guess it's just the, uh, 
the potential. Bugs always come with a story and they just do one of everything. It's just amazing. After its launch, Pokemon Go swept the nation in popularity as millions of people broke their everyday routine to go outside in search of these mythical digital Pokemon creatures. The game also put the spotlight on augmented reality, technology that adds virtual elements into our physical realm. Joining us is Mark Squarek, director of New York University's Mobile Augmented Reality Lab. First of all, I didn't know there was such a thing until this story came up, but this is cool. You guys have been thinking about augmented reality for a long time, and this is just the most popular incarnation of it that people are now paying attention. Uh, we should clarify for our audience, augmented reality and virtual reality, two different things. Yes. So uh, virtual reality, I'm, I'm basically in a, a simulation. I'm in a, a virtual simulation. So the real world is closed off. I'm in completely in a, a virtual simulation, whereas augmented reality is, is a mixture of the virtual and the real coming together. So I have overlays on top of the real world. This could be video game characters running around in here with us. It could be information about your computer. So I could look at it and I could see how to actually take the computer apart. Um, and it could be, you know, uh, data visualization or something like that. So I could be seeing the stock prices of whatever the computer was. I remember there was a time when I could turn my phone around and see different restaurant reviews that were going to pop up on the other side and like in, in kind of, it's in that direction that I need to walk, right? One of the things that sometimes with maps is you sit there and you stand there and you're like, well, I, I wonder if this is the direction that it thinks I'm going or is it in the opposite direction, right? Now, Pokemon has kind of made a splash and it's growing around the world slowly. But um, what was the big breakthrough? Why did people connect to this game, besides the fact that maybe there was a generation of people that grew up with Pokemon cards? And that's a good question. So I've talked, to, uh, I've been doing this stuff for years and we've been actually working on games which were somewhat similar to Pokemon Go. Um, technically, this was possible to do years ago. Um, but uh, what's happened, um, and this is the kind of the consensus of a lot of the developers, it's, it's the branding. Uh, perfect timing, you have Pokemon, um, which has a huge fan base. You have uh, basically everybody knows how to play the game. Now we can actually kind of play it in reality. So it's kind of a mixture of the technology with the perfect kind of branding at the same time. Underlying technology is something that's not Nintendo. And it's not the people who own Pokemon specifically that own all this. Explain the, the back end of that. So this would be Niantic. Um, so they'd be Niantic, they'd be doing um, app development, game studio. Uh, they worked in a game previously called Ingress. Um, you hear a lot of people basically saying that they basically reskinned Ingress. We've taken the other game, swapped out the old models, and moved the new models in. I'm um, kind of going back to your last question. Um, what was one of the things that also kind of pushed it off that Ingress did was it's the gameplay. Even though the technology was there, um, this is a new form of media and. Um, coming up with these unique experiences for this new technology, it, it, it's sort of virgin territory. So um, they've kind of, they've worked the gameplay out quite well. Um, so they've done an excellent job. This is maybe one of the first big games. I mean, you see as a designer, as a gamer, what, what's the next big thing? What are you thinking about? I think that the approach that Niantic's taken with this um, game of Pokemon Go is, is really smart. They basically kind of put a seat belt on it or like safety features. I mean, you hear a lot of people kind of debate over whether or not Pokemon Go is really augmented reality or not. Um, we can kind of talk about that more, but uh, basically um, the object loads in front of me. If, even if I'm looking at the map, it should be loading over here by the 7-Eleven or something. I'm looking over here and it's um, loading in front of me, but it should be over there. Uh, so kind of safety feature so I wouldn't have to swing around. My attention is focused on this little device um, and my field of view, everything's kind of coming out of focus around me. And if I start swinging around, I start running in a certain direction. You've seen some of the crazy videos online of uh, Pokemon Go players um, just sort of charging off after something that they, a virtual object, 
it's not really there. What we're, we're dealing with right now, I would say, is augmented reality if it's used under the correct situation. If I'm not running around or moving around and looking at things um, and it's aligning with the, the real world, then it would be an augmented experience. Um, but where it has to go from here would be having uh, experiences which are really um, starting to mix the physical and virtual. We have like a little bit of that if it's used correctly, but mm -hmm. um, the virtual content should be intelligent to the real world. It should know that the table is here. It should know that the door is there. It, um, and then it could be reacting to real-time feeds as well. Uh, so, so tell me, what are the applications for this besides gaming? What, what could you conceive of augmented reality helping a wider slice of the population? Oh, lots of stuff. Um, so first would be probably like task-based assistance. This would be very useful. Um, augmented reality, I think, uh, has the potential to democratize technology um, or to democratize knowledge, essentially. I could look at anything and I could become incredibly intelligent about it very, very quickly. The comparison would be to the Matrix. So um, you have Keanu Reeves, like, looks at the helicopter, or he wants to learn Kung Fu, he plugs his Kung Fu, and he plugs his, uh, like, neck into the, he jacks it, and all of a sudden he knows how to fly the helicopter, like, within seconds. I could look at a complicated object, and I could understand how it works very well. Um, the uh, comparison could be with uh, IKEA products or something like that. Everybody's had to assemble some sort of product. <laughs> you got all these little bolts all over the floor. Um, with this new technology, I could basically just look, scatter the stuff across the floor, and it would illuminate the bolt that I have to use, the next step, and then it would draw a little line to the hole that it has to go to, and I could, no brainer, like, and then it's telling me how many times I have to turn. If I turn too much, it strips the threads, and it could say, you're getting close, slow down, um, and you could really become very intelligent about uh, things that you have no, no idea about. The person who's not inclined to change the light bulb or to fix the broken part, even with the new technology, probably won't. They're probably still gonna kind of have that distance, but uh, applied to like third world circumstances, you could have something in, akin to a industrial revolution. Knowledge could uh, disseminate just freely across the world and you could see um, basically the class of uh, people rise, like their wealth. You're taking, instead of just watching a YouTube, that layer could be right on top of if it was about to say, fix your car or and it's, change it's the bicycle wheel. It could wheel. be talking to me as I'm doing it, telling me how many times to, to screw the wheel, how many times to do this, that. Um, other things, entertainment, which we're seeing with Pokemon Go, you're seeing the very tip of the iceberg. This is, again, like low-res augmented reality. This wouldn't be what people would consider to be like this really immersive like experience that I'm like, wow. But I'm not quite sure that the, the entire general public's ready for it quite yet. So just get, get used to the idea that, that you have content or information located at specific geographic locations and then how to kind of access that safely. People will start to kind of become uh, able to access it more easily. Um, other things could be navigation, like we we're sort of saying as well. Um, I could, uh, you were bringing up the, the basically the Yelp um, mm -hmm. iteration. One of the ones that was famous was the subway stops. It was one of the first apps that came out for smartphones. I could, I can look around, I can see all the subway stops around me, I could see the bus stops, I can see my distance to the bus stop, and then um, the newer iterations would actually show you like how long until the next bus would show up. All right. Mark Squarick of NYU. This future is augmented and it's possible. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It takes more than just sticks and mud to build a nest. Now, scientists are learning that a very small bird is capable of making big changes based on climate and location. The Great Smoky Mountains, and even the larger region of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, are a treasure trove of biodiversity. The forests and streams, as well as the mountains and valleys, are filled with a seemingly endless variety of life, both large and small. And all of these things fit together and help tell the story of the Smokies and what we're trying to protect. 20,000 different species counted so far in Great Smoky Mountains National Park alone. But this is the story of just one tiny creature filling one tiny spot in that web of life. 
meet the Carolina chickadee. Most all songbirds in North America, most of our breeding birds are in decline. And so if we know more about them, it might enable us to be able to better protect and conserve them. Scientists know some things about this little bird. It weighs about 0.4 ounces. That's about the same as a half slice of bread. The Carolina chickadee is about five inches tall. The wingspan is about eight inches across. Carolina chickadees, they do a single brood in a season. So that means they have one shot at it every year. And if they fail, then they have to wait till the following year. Like most songbirds, the female Carolina chickadee builds the nest. Once the nest is ready, the female lays one egg per day. Once there is a full clutch, the female begins incubating the eggs. And that is a really critical time for both themselves and the nestlings. So um, they need to keep the temperature of the eggs above a certain threshold in order for them to develop properly. And it turns out nest building is critically important to the survival of Carolina chickadees. The better the female builds the nest, the better she'll be able to take care of her little ones because she will be healthier. So being on the eggs and keeping them warm means that they're not out foraging and taking care of themselves. So they have to balance this, their activity to take care of the eggs and keep them at an optimal temperature for development and taking care of themselves so that they can survive to reproduce again in a following year. And it seemed like um, a good opportunity for us to ask what is really critical about female behavior that's going to lead them to have a lot of reproductive success. But to study nesting behavior, researchers need to observe nests. Nest boxes were placed at varying elevations. That meant different temperatures, and that translated into different times for nesting. Temperature sensors were placed outside and inside the boxes, as well as inside the nests, for comparison. These are just um, a quick example of some of the variations that we find. Like this is a smaller nest. So you can see that they typically will build a layer of moss and then they'll build the cup on top. You can see they'll use a little grass or fur that they find. And you can see how this one, of course, is so much taller and deeper and a little more insulated than this one. Researchers found the female Carolina chickadee didn't build one standard type of nest. The style depended on where the nest box was located. So the females want to try to reach about 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the nest temperature. Like if the eggs are not kept at a proper temperature, then the embryos won't develop correctly, so they won't hatch. And um, as far as the nestlings, when they're first born, they're unable to regulate their body temperature for three to four days. So they really depend on warmth from their, from their mother and from the nest to regulate their temperature. Different types of insulation and different types of nest construction were used to adapt the nest to the climate. That allowed the female to stay stronger and take better care of her nestlings. This is an investment that they're making um, that might help them in, when they're incubating. So it might alleviate some of the pressure of um, being on the nest so often to keep the temperature of the eggs up. Because if there's a lot of insulation in the nest, then the temperature of the eggs might fall more slowly when she leaves the nest. So she can be off for a little bit longer. That means the female can forage longer and be stronger and healthier. The question, what happens as the climate changes. It's, there's probably a lot of uh, factors that are involved with decline of um, songbirds in North America, but the fact that, they, that these birds have one shot at a reproductive in a season is probably going to be a big factor for chickadees. A team of scientists at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, have charted what may be the most accurate map of the brain to date. They join reporter Andrea Vasquez for this week's edition of The Hangout. I'm Matthew Glasser and David Van Nessen. Thank you for joining us. Thank Our you. pleasure. When we're talking about this map of the brain, even when we're talking about road maps, there are different types. There are some that map topography or roads or, or state boundaries. What exactly are you mapping here? So we're mapping basically uh, four 
four properties of how the brain is organized. It's, um, it's architecture, so what, what is going on at the microscopic level, its function, uh, how different parts of the brain are connected, and then how uh, individual areas of the brain are organized. So those four key things are what we were mapping uh, to make this uh, new uh, parcellation or, or map of the brain. And if I can add just a little bit, uh, we're, our focus is on the human cerebral cortex and what we're mapping are the equivalent, uh, by, by analogy, of the political subdivisions of the Earth's surface. We map those on top of maps of the, the convolutions or folds of the cerebral cortex, which are analogous to the mountains and valleys of the Earth's surface. And this is coming out of uh, a longer standing project, the Human Connectome Project. Can you tell us more about that? That's correct. The Human Connectome Project started in 2010 and it's wrapping up in its current studies of the young adult uh, human connectome. We studied 1,200 healthy young adults, and in projects that are just starting as the uh, young adult human connectome project wraps up, uh, we will be studying uh, the development and structure and function and connectivity in children and in older adults to get a better picture of the entire human lifespan. There are also a number of uh, projects that are focused on comparing connectomes uh, in normals to uh, connectomes in various either neurological or psychiatric diseases. David, do you remember how many of those are? There are 13 projects funded already by the National Institutes of Health and several more that are likely to be funded in the coming year or so. And a connectome what exactly does that entail? A connectome, I like to say it's a comprehensive map of connections in the brain, but then I immediately put comprehensive in quotes because it's only to the resolution or ability to resolve uh, the basic units of the, the human brain. And for the Human Connectome Project, our resolving power are little tiny uh, volume units that are tenth of an inch or so on a side and literally contain hundreds of thousands of neurons and um, millions and millions of synapses between neurons. So we'd like to get even better, but there are technical limits to what one can achieve with modern technology. And I'd say there, there are two kinds of connectomes that we're interested in measuring here. One is a, what we call a functional connectome, and that's basically showing how different brain areas, um, how their activity uh, correlates with each other. So if you put somebody in the scanner, MRI scanner, and uh, you just let have them rest and let their mind wander and think whatever thoughts they want to think, and while you're doing that, you can measure the MRI signal and we look for where uh, different brain areas are um, showing similar fluctuations in that MRI signal. That's one kind of connectome. And then the other kind is a structural connectome. And there we're trying to map the actual physical connections uh, between brain areas albeit in a very indirect way. Up until now, there have been other diagrams and maps of the brain, but how have those fallen short, clearly, of what you are now accomplishing and working to uh, keep building up? So there have been maps, or what we call parcellations, of the human cerebral cortex for more than a century. Uh, the classical maps from a century ago are kind of quaint and uh, uh, charming but well out of date, they're analogous to 16th century maps of the Earth's surface. In more recent years, there have been major advances in getting better maps, but previous mapping efforts have focused on one type of information or what we call one imaging modality at a time. And as a consequence, uh, those earlier maps got some regions, some areas more or less correct, but missed out on or misidentified others. So as Matt said, uh, a moment ago by virtue of looking at four independent types of information at one time, we feel confident that we've gotten more accurate and more comprehensive maps, albeit it's not the end of the story. There's still a lot more to learn. And how much of a given person's brain would align with some of these maps that are being developed and how much is shaped by unique experiences and genetic uh, ass factors? That's a great question and the answer is we don't know yet. What we can say is that in the great majority of the hundreds of individuals we examined using the computer algorithm that uh, mentioned a moment ago, 
uh, we can ad identify nearly all of the 180 distinct cortical areas in each hemisphere in nearly all individuals. So they're present and to the high degree accounted for, but they aren't identical. They differ in size uh, by more than a factor of two from one individual to another. And in a very interesting subset, about 10% of our uh, population that we studied, uh, at least some areas are uh, what we call atypical in their arrangement. They've switched their neighborhood relationships with nearby areas. And so they have uh, uh, the same basic constellation of areas, but it's like uh, California and Nevada had switched their places on the map. Matt Glasser and David Van Essen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Mike Zeman. See you next time. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.